start with our second session our right. uh, uh, second session will be uh, moderated by sri samsuddin khan from office of cca over to you sir good afternoon to all part participants and respected speakers in session 2 i invite and war warm welcome to spe speaker dr greg adamson professor university of melbourne for talks com presentation on identity and blockchain <coughs> as you know dr greg adamson has worked with pki applications since the 1990s and blockchain since 2013 he is a cyber security consultant specializing in healthcare government and financial services he is a chair of the ieee standards association industry connections meta issues in cyber security and a past president of the ieee society on social implications of the technology as <coughs> you you are already aware that blockchain is an emerging technology of the present and future which may impact revolutionary transitions in the field of pkis and digital technology in enabling blockchain applications and systems sir you have been allotted 20 minutes time for this talks and 5 minutes for questions and answer sessions welcome sir right okay thank you very much i'll just share my presentation what i wanted to look at uh, today is a, this is the question of identity and blockchain and both of these are enormously popular topics so blockchain uh the the field of blockchain has sparked uh cryptocurrency and uh if we want to really go into the world of fantasy we need to look no further than the popular press treatment of uh cryptocurrency non-fungible tokens and so forth i won't be speaking about that today at all uh but it is definitely something that has a lot of people very excited Uh, the question of identity is probably a question that has a lot of people very worried. So people are very concerned about making sure that as they're developing important new technology technologies, they're able to address the issue of identity in an appropriate manner, an appropriate, respectful, and legal manner. So let's let's just start off with uh, a few comments about blockchain. Uh, blockchain has changed the way people think about trust on the internet. I know there are some people who say blockchain replaces trust, but the reality is that blockchain provides trust. Even though it's using mathematical formula, uh, it still focuses on encouraging people to believe and have confidence in, which is a, a traditional definition of trust. So to Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, Nakamoto's uh, 2008 paper is uh, very clear in what in its uh, explanation of what it's trying to achieve. Yet enormous confusion still surrounds that, and I'd encourage anybody who's interested in blockchain at all to go and read that paper. It'll only it'll take you less than an hour. It's very clear, very straightforward, very simple. Some of the pieces are, are deeply technical. but they're placed in a context which is completely understandable as you would expect from a founding paper in a new field so one question which many people struggle with is what unique contribution does blockchain technology make and i encourage you if you're talking to someone who presents themselves as a leader on blockchain or as an expert on blockchain to ask them that question what is it that's special about blockchain and uh once one knows that one can look at what blockchain is good at what it's bad at what it should be used for and for example whether it can assist pki the um this presentation illustrates the answers by examining a business architecture question and i find that's a useful way to understand a technology you look at an actual challenge and you uh try to work out an answer and that makes you ask yourself what uh, how how the technology works uh just to say i've been working with blockchain for about 8 years i'm currently part of the uh standards australia uh group on blockchain the technical committee 
and uh, I'm a member of two working groups of of ISIS, ISIS of uh, the International Standards Organization's Blockchain Initiative, and I approach this from the perspective of the data communications engineer. And what I'd like to specifically, what I'd the question I'd like to ask is, can blockchain be compliant with the uh, GDPR right to be forgotten, so-called right to be forgotten? Now, I'll begin by with a uh, a simple metaphor for how blockchain works. So, blockchain, what blockchain does is it solves the double spending problem. And to quote the Bitcoin, the original paper, we need a way for the payee to know that the previous owners did not sign any earlier transactions. And he answer, uh, he or she or they, uh, it's unclear who Satoshi Nakamoto is, uh, answers this with a philosophical approach. And they say, the only way to confirm the absence of a transaction is to be aware of all transactions. And that's an interesting, that's, that's a great view. Uh, it's an interesting view. It's a very informative view. And through this approach, um, this uh, we have a way of developing trust in the trustless internet. And I'll speak a little bit about that in a minute. And I've used the knitting. I've put a picture of knitting here because for me, the best metaphor to describe how blockchain works is that if you're familiar with the process of knitting, there's a problem. This is a, a person knitting with a pair of knitting needles, as we see on the screen here. There's a problem, which is that if a person drops a stitch, what's called drops a stitch, and only realizes this quite a long way later, the only way to fix that problem is to go back and, and uh, to actually undo all the knitting back to the point where the stitch has been dropped. And, the, and blockchain is like that. If you want to change a transaction that's occurred in the past on a blockchain, you have to undo all the transactions between that time and the present. And because of the character of uh, the structural character of the blockchain architecture, this takes an enormous amount of effort and, in fact, is effectively impossible to achieve unless you have a half or near half of the total processing power of the entire blockchain environment. Now, when I say cyberspace is insecure, this is not a uh, criticism. This was actually a design feature. And I want to look, I want to point to two uh, places where this was very clearly confirmed. The first is, the first was in the design of packet switching. So packet switching was a technology developed by Paul Barron in the early 1960s uh, for the Rand, at the Rand Corporation. And he designed this uh, as a way of of addressing the problem of single points of failure. And as part of this solution, and this was then, this then became the basis of the internet, and it's the basis of packet switching uh, technology, all packet switching technologies. And he said one of his uh, papers on this, paper nine, which was, I think, the last or one of the last papers that he wrote on the subject as part of the series at RAND, looked at security secrecy and tamper-free considerations. And what he said was that rather than tack on security at the end, security had to be built in in building pack in creating a packet switching system. Now when his technology was adopted by the DARPA project in the late 1960s, they ignored this proposal and decided not to include any security. So it wasn't that they were ignorant of the requirement for security. They decided that the internet did not need security. Now, if we then jump forward 20 years to the late 1980s, so that was in 1969. In 1989, Tim Berners-Lee wrote a proposal um, uh, called Information Management, a proposal in which he created the basis of the World Wide Web through hypertext. And one of the, uh, in the template that he completed for CERN, the European research body where he was working, 
the template had a section on non-requirements. And under non-requirements, uh, Tim Berners-Lee listed two. He listed copyright enforcement and data security. So once again, right at the heart of the invention of the World Wide Web, the decision was made not to include data security. So therefore, we can say very clearly, uh, the lack of data security is a feature, not a bug, of the internet and the World Wide Web. So that created a problem. How do we, is it possible to achieve security once the World Wide Web has all been built? And when you, and when I say that, go back to Paul Barron's uh, comment that you can't add security at the end. So the answer is to all of those security features and initiatives, which are thousands upon thousands of proposals and suggestions for how to make the internet secure, are all um, after the after the fact. And according to Paul Barron's argument, are therefore all uh, inadequate. And I, I like to think uh, that the I like to think of blockchain as a technology which has managed to use the underpinning characteristics of the technology itself. The way the technology has functioned at least and since and since the late 1980s. So when you look at blockchain, blockchain does not depend on any add on to the World Wide Web. Uh, sorry, to the Internet or the World Wide Web for that matter. What it does is it uses the characteristics of the internet, that is, the foundations, the underlying principles of the internet, to achieve security. Now, that wasn't what um, uh, the DARPA group were planning to do when they built the internet, but it's what they actually achieved. So they, uh, they established this possibility for someone to come along and use their fundamental underpinning architecture to provide security. So that's, uh, and that is blockchain. And that is why blockchain is fundamentally different to every other security solution that's provided to secure the internet. Blockchain uses the characteristics of the internet. It doesn't try to add to those. Now, there are lots of use cases. Uh, cryptocurrency, supply chain, um, renewable energy distribution, registers of things, of facts, of activities, and smart contracts. There's lots of lots of ways you can use blockchain or distributed ledger technology, as it's also called. But the question of what is blockchain good for, uh, that, that I mentioned earlier on, is, uh, is not addressed by simply what it's been applied to. So if we look at the security triad of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, easily remembered because the initials are CIA, we can see that blockchain does some of these and it doesn't do others, or at least it does two and it doesn't do one. So blockchain does integrity very well. The purpose of blockchain is integrity. It enables you to store information in a way that uh, unless an adversary can take control of the entire platform or most of the platform or, or, or a large proportion of the platform, uh, you will retain the integrity of the transactions. And that is what blockchain is known for. Now, as I mentioned, blockchain is also known as distributed ledger technology. And that distributed characteristic also provides uh, as a benefit availability. So it's very hard for a public blockchain to be overwhelmed by, for example, a distributed denial of service attack because the information sits in lots of various places. So if a few or if, if a few or even a significant proportion of the uh, of the hosts across the blockchain are, are successfully attacked, uh, there are still others that can maintain the blockchain. So you've got integrity and availability. What about confidentiality? Now, blockchain's feature is that it provides uh, a record, a publicly available record for a public blockchain of all the transactions. Now, it's sort of completely obvious that if all of the transactions are available publicly, it's not providing confidentiality. Now, there are ways to achieve confidentiality, and there are some blockchains that don't need it. So, sorry, sir, sorry, you have five minutes left, and now you conclude as fast I'll, as possible. 
Okay, right. Uh, so the integrity. So the confidentiality is uh, not available now. Confidentiality. If we think of the overall function of blockchain. Uh, the confidentiality is one aspect that can be added on. But when you add it on, you've see, all you've done is once again add security at the end of your process. So the integrity, and the, you can see that uh, integrity is an ongoing part of the blockchain and confidentiality is, but is possibly a passing phase, depending on the security of the technology that you add on. So that gets us to the Euro, to the EU's general data protection regulation and the right to erasure or the right to be forgotten. Can, and this this is sort of once again a bit of a philosophical challenge. Can we both remember and forget? So blockchain, as I've explained, uh, addresses the integrity challenge of conf, of the confidentiality, integrity, and availability triad in the trusted and untrusted environment of the internet. This can, it can provide persistent evidence of identity. So if you really don't want to forget somebody, you put them on the blockchain and you will never forget them. However, when we face such a requirement as the right to be forgotten, this feature becomes a flaw. And this is particularly important for sensitive health data, which may remain important for 80 years or more. A person's uh, health data at their birth May remain relative, may remain relevant for the next eighty years. So the very simple, I won't, uh, I won't dwell on this. The very simple answer is that the blockchain can store a hash of the data to validate, that is, prove the data, but not store the data itself. And within the standard architecture of blockchain, one finds, such as the proposed ISO. Uh, a planned ISO uh, architecture, one finds that part of the environment is the off-chain storage of data. Now, I know that may, that may not sound very dramatic, but it is the solution. You store it off-chain, and that means that if you want to break the link to that data that you want to have the option of forgetting, you simply break the link. The, the hash can suddenly point to nothing anymore. The hash is still there forever. But what it points to has been moved. So there are significant benefits, and I'll just skim through these given the time, providence, repeated, uh, repeatability, digital certificates. And that's where I think PKI can benefit greatly from blockchain. We have protection through custody and memory, and we have safety through uh, safety from injury and from risk. And I won't go through any of those, but they all are all significant benefits. And with that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much. Sir, one my question is, sir, <coughs> suppose without uh, changing existing applications, how we can implement blockchain? Because blockchain is a technology which impacts on the applications, database or systems. So blockchain, when I, when I say that blockchain does not require changes to the internet, what I mean is that you do not have to change the structure of the DNS. You do not have to change the structure of TCP IP, you do, or of TCP or of IP. You do not have to change the structure of, GB, uh, of, uh, of uh, the boundary gateway protocol. You, none of the all the existing structures can stay in place. You still need to build it as a platform, but it doesn't require anybody across the internet to change what they're doing in order for it to work. Uh, one more questions from our, our um, Dr. Balaji. I'm not hearing. Are you audible? Okay. I, I... You. Yeah. So uh, my question is actually uh, how uh, 
uh, uh, blockchain is actually currently uh, changing the contours of the DNS system also, domain name services. And uh, there are uh, 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 currencies, uh, digital currencies as well as virtual currencies like ETH, uh, Ethernet and all, they are trying to issue uh, uh, domain names from their own side. So how do you think uh, is, it is going to shape or change the identity of the virtual entities is what my question is. Okay, so this goes back to, uh, this, is a, this is a long time debate on the internet. This goes way back before blockchain. I remember, I remember discussing this in the, in the late 1990s. What do you do when people try to corrupt the DNS system uh, by simply issuing different sets of, uh, I issuing uh, different information? And for, for decades, this has been, it's been, well, maybe it's a problem, maybe it's not a problem. Uh, the, the difficulty becomes uh, who's, going to, who's going to respect it or, or what, what obligation is there for internet router, for the internet routing system to respect these um, extra, extra domains. And I think the answer goes back to the, the answer that's always been considered in the past, that is, um, if you if you want to muck around with something, don't be surprised if it suddenly breaks on you. And I would say that'll be the uh, that, that would be the expected outcome of people who try to do this uh, if they if they don't do it through the uh, IETF RFC pro the appropriate RFC process. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I uh, you know now identity is being used in the blockchain. That means that I can store different uh, identities, need not have to be unique. And also it is scalable, almost like a DNS. One of the examples has been in the Saverin identity blockchain. That means you store where the ID is, so I can have different IDs. In the same way, why can't it be done? Which is being used for like Ethereum, etc. It becomes a very essential thing to see that it exactly does what it is supposed to be doing. Yeah. So that and uh, that picks up my point of understanding that either you uh, either you know something or you don't know it. You can't. Well, sorry. Apologies with quantum. With quantum computing, you can both know and not know things. But leaving, leaving aside that, uh, uh, in, the, in the normal world, either we know something or we don't know something. And if we want to develop a system where we allow people to change their identity by pointing to a particular location and that, that location is variable, then that is, a, that is a very good and practical use. On the other hand, if we wanted to store some, uh, if we wanted to store store someone's public key um, to validate uh, to validate their document signed documents, we wouldn't want to make it possible for someone to go in and hack that and change that and replace that with a different public key in order to uh, uh, in order to corrupt the uh, PKI processes. So that's sort of, but but what what you're saying makes complete sense to me. This is the, this is uh, just thinking about the architecture of it and applying the architecture in an intelligent and and uh, useful way. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, sir.